Good afternoon, everyone. Although it feels like a good evening almost at this time of year, I'd like to welcome everyone to our annual Saul Goldstein Memorial Lecture hosted here at Woodsworth College. My name is Joe Deloge, and it's my privilege and honor to be serving as the principal of Woodsworth College. And we're so pleased that so many of you uh, could join us this afternoon for this particular lecture. First, I'd like to tell you a little bit about Saul Goldstein. Uh, after who this lecture is named. Saul was born in 1910 in Germany uh, to a line of rabbi. He left Europe as a refugee in 1938 and he settled in the UK where he became a director of a company that made fashion accessories. Mr. Goldstein was a founder of a local synagogue and was very learned in Jewish laws and customs. Upon his retirement in 1993, uh, Saul immigrated to Canada and began a second career in education. So in 1999, he enrolled in courses here at the University of Toronto. And he was registered as a student at Woodsworth College as part of our college senior citizen cohort. Uh, today, we welcome many seniors to the college. Well, in his early 90s, he was granted a BSc in psychology. He attended convocation in the year that he was uh, graduated and not to be outdone in his uh, early 90s, he re-enrolled again as a graduate student in the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education. When Saul unfortunately passed away in the winter of 2007, his family requested that donations in his honour be made to Woodsworth College. So we are honoured and we are privileged to host the annual Saul Goldstein Lecture. However, it doesn't end with Saul. It begins with the rest of his family, who are a U of T family. His son, Roger, is professor of medicine. His daughter-in-law, Rose Geist, is a professor in the Department of Psychiatry. His granddaughter is now studying psychology at U of T, and the connections go on. With the support of family and friends, an endowment was created in the honor of Saul Goldstein to establish uh, this annual lecture. So thank you to the Goldstein family. Uh, for their support, their thoughtfulness in allowing us to hold uh, this lecture. Now on to our distinguished speaker today. Janice Grossstein is the Bellsberg Professor of Conflict Management and a faculty member in the Department of Political Science and for many years has led with inspiration and innovation as director of the Monk, Center, uh, Monk School for Global Affairs here at the University of Toronto. She's a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, one of the highest academic honors in this country, and an honorary foreign member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She is the co-author with Eugene Lang of the prize-winning The Unexpected War, Canada in Kandahar. Her most recent book is Diplomacy in the Digital Age, and she was the Massey Lecture in 2001 and a Trudeau Fellow. Professor Gross Stein was awarded the Molson Prize by the Canada Council for an outstanding contribution by a social scientist in public debate. And of course, all of us who watch TVO, CBC, and every other major venue across the country know Janice is front and center on those issues. She re has received an honorary doctorate of laws from the University of Alberta, the University of Cape Breton, McMaster University, and the Hebrew B University of Jerusalem. She's a member of the Order of Ontario and of the Order of Canada. We are great, so grateful that Janice has joined us today and we welcome her to the podium. Janice. Mm -hmm. Thank you very, very much, Joe. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, uh, but in the interest of full disclosure, um, let me start by saying that I had the privilege of personally knowing Saul Goldstein. Uh, now, as I understand from Roger and Rose, the people, you choose the lecturer. Uh, so they did not know when you asked me uh, that I have had that pleasure over the years of not only, not only knowing Saul, but knowing Roger and Rose and Andrew Goldstein and Matthew Goldstein who, by the way, are also U of T graduates. You missed Andrew and Matthew. Uh, one is a graduate, Matthew is a graduate of the Faculty of Law, and Andrew is a graduate of the Robin School. So the, the, the tradition goes on. But 
Saul was um, a real presence uh, in the Goldstein family. Um, and one of these really extraordinary people whose, I guess the best word to describe him is, was luminous, right? And he drew people to him through his gentleness and his knowledge. Um, I also remember the period when Saul was enrolled at Wordsworth College. And all I can say is, um, for him, the privilege of coming to university was something that he never really imagined that he would experience. But in all truthfulness, it became a family affair. Um, everybody got involved in those psychology term papers. Uh, there was a rich discussion in the Goldstein family each time a term paper was due. So Joe, uh, the whole family went to Woodsworth, uh, not only Saul Goldstein. So what a privilege for me, Roger and Rose, to do this uh, in memory of Saul. So when I was asked to do the Goldstein Lecture, um, I actually picked a subject that I thought he would care about. Uh, so it's not by accident that I chose this subject. Um, it's called the Innovation Frontier, where public institutions meet the 21st century. Uh, and fundamentally, and I hope we can have a conversation about this. So I'm going to try to keep the formal part of this uh, shorter rather than longer. But we see a great deal of innovation uh, in the private sector. And yet, in the public sector, and particularly in broader public institutions that are so fundamental in shaping our life, whether it's the way government works, whether it's the way our healthcare system delivers care, whether it's the way educational institutions function, um, they are much slower to change. They make, generally speaking, much less space for innovation. And that's puzzling, right? It's puzzling. Because, in fact, the quality of the people uh, is just as good. The education level is just as high. So there's something in the air then, in public institutions that inhibits, in a serious way, the capacity to change and to lead change and to open up to new ideas. I don't see anybody from the senior university administration here, except my friend Joe, and he will not turn me in, as we say, but the University of Toronto, which is Canada's greatest university, um, one of the 20 best in the world, and is home to researchers who struggle uh, to create and succeed in creating uh, the most advanced research, but yet, and I could ask this of Roger in his department as well, if we actually look at how we function, we're actually remarkably resistant to change in the university. One of my favorite conversations was with one of my colleagues when we were looking at the growing faculty-student ratio. We have larger and larger numbers of students with the same amount of faculty. Um, and I said to this, you're a senior academic, do you think that we might need to think about doing some things differently, given how big our classes are getting? And he looked at me, and you know, he took a breath, and he said, we've been doing this for 800 years from the University of Bruges. We will continue to do it for another 800 years. That's the end of the conversation. Now, that's an extreme example, obviously, and Joe and I were just celebrating uh, the programs that he and I share, which are the wonderful new one programs that have been instituted in the university. But I think it's fair to say that change is harder in public institutions um, than it is in the private sector. So I want to make three arguments right, about why this matters. Why should we care that public institutions and the broader social sector lack in their innovative capacity. So the first point I really want to make this afternoon is that social innovation 
is a key part of a successful society. It's not enough to have an innovative economy. We actually have to have innovative social institutions. Second point I would make, and we make this to our government, is that public policy, generically speaking, has to explicitly make space for social innovation. It makes space for economic innovation, for technological innovation. It has all kinds of elaborate credits. Um, in, frankly, I think there are now uh, close to three quarters of a billion dollars of tax and research credits that go directly to firms that innovate through their R&D programs. We have nothing like that on the other side of the ledger, on the social side of the ledger. So we need investors in social innovation as the same, in the same sense that we need investors in innovation in the private sector but we're not having that conversation in Canada. And then the third point, and I'm not really sure this is right, um, is my attempt to grapple with why they, we are slower uh, in the broader social sector to innovate. And let me put on the table at least this afternoon that you know here I am running against the grain, I realize this, and especially in the wake of the kind of politics we've seen in this country for the last uh, three months, that actually what is holding us back is the heavy hand of regulators who focus on accountability. So that accountability means short-term results, constant monitoring, uh, verification virtually at uh, every stage of a process to the point where innovative and creative people are discouraged and leave social institutions and public institutions for spaces where they're freer to experiment. At the root of this, I think, is our terrible aversion to failure that we have. We've never made it safe to fail in this country in very smart ways. On the other end of the spectrum is a society like Israel, where because of the urgency, the slim margin uh, which shapes virtually everything that happens in that society, smart failures are rewarded all the time and it's part of the culture. In Canada, we're too comfortable, we're too safe, and that actually translates into um, an aversion to failure of any kind. So that's fundamentally where I want to go today, all right? I, I'm getting some support from Matthew here. And if I get some support from Matthew, that's my toughest critic right there in the front row. Let me talk about three kinds of innovation. Um, which are generally described in the private sector and see how they move over and play in, in, in funny kind of paradoxical ways actually and then tell you the story of just two, let me just take two examples of social innovation that are interesting, although I could tell you many more if we have time. First kind of innovation that we talk about all the time is efficiency innovation. And actually people who work in healthcare have heard this nonstop. We can in fact improve our processes so that we do more with the same. Um, and that's been the story in many cases in the healthcare delivery system for the last 20 years. It's also the story in the university, I think, that because we have public budgets and public resources that are at best constant, if not shrinking, we continuously innovate our processes so that we provide care or educate students uh, more and more with a, with a budget that is functionally frozen when you look at it in real dollars. Now, what does that really do, by the way? And it does the same thing in the social sector as it does in the private sector. It actually reduces jobs if it's not accompanied by other kinds of innovation, right? You can, can you see the logic of why that would happen? If you're educating more students, 
with the same number of faculty, you're not creating more jobs for young faculty. You're just squeezing additional efficiencies out of the system. So if you're not innovating at the same time, and we see this in the private sector as well, we create systems that have fewer and fewer challenging good jobs. That's the challenge. The second one is more encouraging um, and I think more promising and we call this sustaining innovation where we're continuously improving the services we provide, the products we develop. Um, so each time we improve a heart monitor, right? And there's a constant, we see this all the time in research at the University of Toronto. Each time we improve a heart monitor or a teaching program, uh, we make it better. We're constantly trying to make it better to improve the performance. Here's where we actually create new opportunities and new benefits. So that's, in, in a sense, at the middle range of innovation. And there's a wonderful book written by a colleague of mine at the Monk School, Dan Bresnitz, which is called The Run of the Red Queen. Um, and it looks at the innovative capacity of Chinese society. And he says that that's what the Chinese do, right? They don't invent, but they continuously improve. Um, and so they take products that are already there and they continuously improve them and make them better and make them better and make them better. And that creates, brings value and brings benefit. The innovation that probably we know most about, um, and this is temperamental, I like this the best, is what we call disruptive innovation. It disrupts the way we do things and the way we live. How many people in this room have a smartphone? Okay, so that's pretty good for a room of seniors, actually. Uh, so that's uh, over half the room. So you have a little computer in your hand, right? The w if you just think back, the web is only 20 years old didn't exist before 1992 um, for people outside government to use. So in a period of 20 years, a disruptive innovation fundamentally changed the way we work, the way we live. Uh, that's what you call a disruptive innovation. How many people have an electric typewriter in their house now that they use? How many people remember an electric typewriter? Okay. Right? You see my point. So people like, companies like Underwood that made electric typewriters are no more uh, because there was disruptive innovation. How many people would trade their smartphone to get a typewriter back? Okay, not a single one. Right? So that tells me that you think there's advantages to having a little computer in your hand as you go about your day. There are many, many examples of disruptive innovation. These are the ones that we know best. They're the hardest, actually, to enable. And there are many fewer of these in the social sector than there are in the economic sector. And that's really the, the problem uh, that I want to grapple with. And why does it matter? Why should we care? It's because the broader public sector, which includes our public institutions and all the associated social institutions. They're the ones that are crucially important in shaping the quality of public space, in defining the quality of services that we get, and in fact, in sustaining communities as opposed to simply economies. So they really matter. They make a difference. Okay, let me give you one example of a social innovation. And we, we have an actually very interesting research group um, going right now. And one of the wonderful things about the University of Toronto is faculty come together from everywhere uh, if we're all interested in a common problem, right? So we have a group of faculty, and you, you might find it interesting to, to know where they come from. Two from the Faculty of Medicine, two from Rotman across the street, uh, two from the Faculty of Engineering, and two from the Monk School. So that's not natural, right? Uh, you don't bump into each other normally, uh, Stephen, in the, in the, at the water cooler. 
And why did we put together a group like that? Because we were interested in the problem of how do you innovate for the poor? And that was the defining question we set ourselves. Um, and what had to happen so that the quality of services and products that are available to the poor would improve? Uh, what did we have to do? How did we have to think about this, what we call a wicked problem, right? It's a tough problem. And one of the ways we, un we understood quite quickly that we had to think about this is we had to treat the poor as seriously as consumers as any innovator would treat somebody in Canada who is buying a smartphone. We had to really deeply understand what they needed, what they would use, what they would adopt. It wasn't a question of us saying to poor people, here's what we think you need, because we have a lot of that, and it almost always fails. People don't use it. So we develop great technology, we develop great products, but there are no adopters uh, for those of you who study innovation processes. So let me give you two examples. One is the Grameen Bank, which I think some of you may know about. You probably know about it because uh, Mahmoud Yunus won the Nobel Prize about seven years ago, I think it was, for the Grameen Bank. And he, he, he started with a puzzle, which is where most researchers start with. Uh, here was all this development assistance going to very poor societies, um, a lot of philanthropy and charitable organizations, but it wasn't doing very much, if at all, to lift people out of poverty. So what was wrong? So he reversed the equation and he said, what would happen if we started lending to poor people as opposed to giving charity to poor people? What if we made small loans? Would people be interested? And would it change the way poor people thought about finance, thought about livelihoods, thought about business? And out of that grew what is today probably the largest movement, um, billions of lenders involved in what we call microfinance very small loans, and very high interest rates, actually, which is part of the problem that we face in this sector, but very small loans to poor people. So how does this work? And Yunus and his colleagues, starting at a university in Bangladesh, started really to look at this because they had to get investors who were going to provide a pool of finance that you could lend to the poor, right? So you had to be repaid. It, it was not charity. That was the point. What did they find? Not surprisingly, they started with women. <laughs> because women repaid the loans. Men had a much lower rate of repayment. Secondly, they didn't lend, and if you actually think about the psychology of this, they didn't lend to an individual woman. They lent to groups of women so that there was peer pressure coming from what, from the, you know, the, there would be 10 or 12 women in a group. So, and there was a treasurer who kept the records, and usually these are illiterate people, so they do it, I've seen it, so they do it with strokes, right? You don't write numbers, you write strokes. And there's an account book that 10 or 12 women will have. And what do they do? So, Thinking of the village that I went to uh, in Afghanistan, one woman bought a cow. And all of a sudden, boy, <laughs> she was really important because there was milk and uh, her husband took the bicycle and drove the milk into the village market to sell and her status changed entirely in that family because she was now part of an enterprise. Well, it got even better because the cow had a calf, right? And she got a second loan uh, because her husband, she, they bought another bicycle. And they had a job for their son, who also drove with the father to the village market because they were now producing much more milk than they could consume. So all of a sudden, these were people involved in enterprise development, producing a product that they knew their neighbors really needed, which was milk. There are 
infinite numbers of stories like this. Um, and the research, and the, the research that we've been doing is as a result of, and let me, how, what do you think the interest rate is, by the way? Because look how expensive this is to do. A tiny amount of money, you need to monitor it. You need accountants in the banks that actually keep track of these loans. You need repayment records. Take a guess at the interest. That's routine in microfinance. And it's $100 billion now, globally. Just a random guess, if you don't know. <laughs> Two, 10, keep going. It's 34%. Right, 34%, which one of us would go and borrow? Not one, right? So the challenge became, and, the, and I, we, you know, the research community has asked over and over again, why, why? Because it's that expensive actually to manage. You have hundreds of thousands of tiny loans that you have to keep track of. Now the other side of this, of course, employment for a lot of people who are keeping track of these loans. But the bottom line question for microfinance is, does it lift people out of poverty? Is the woman who had the cow and then the calf, is her family doing better? Can she afford to send her youngest children to school? And in many cases, though not all, there's a significant improvement in the welfare of the family as a result of microfinance. Now, not as much as we'd like, and we have, so the next, innovative challenge is how do you design banks that can run more efficiently so you don't have to charge 34 percent right that's by the way a sustaining innovation problem it's no longer disruptive because microfinance is the principal way we lend to the poor development assistance is a trickle all the world's development assistance is a trickle compared to the funds that flow through microfinance. But we have to make the institutions more efficient so that we can get the interest rate lower if we really want to increase the success rate at which we're pulling people out of poverty. Once the bank was up and running, Mahmoud Yunus got bored, which is true of all disruptive innovators. They're interested as long as they can't solve the problem. Matthew Goldstein knows this very well. As soon as they solve the problem, they're moving on, right? So he got bored and he went on to, he turned the bank into a foundation, which is now run. Um, the government of Bangladesh invested in it and the shares in the bank are 90% owned by poor people. Which again is remarkable. These, if you just think about it, these people can't borrow money anywhere for anything, right? They don't have a MasterCard or a Visa, nor do they often have any title to land, nor do they have any collateral to put up. So this is their only access to a loan to start any kind of a business. If you don't have access to loans, you can't start any kind of a business. Turn it over to the poor as shareholders and did a partnership with the non yogurt um, from Switzerland and France where um, they enriched the yogurt to provide the micronutrients that are so often one of the biggest public health challenges that we face because children are malnourished in very poor societies. And partnering with the non, they created businesses which manufacture in Bangladesh and India this enriched yogurt, sells it in fact to mothers at a price that's low enough so that the business is sustaining and it can operate as a business rather than as a charity. And that's the model again and again and again that we see when we get social innovation. The challenge for almost all of us, though, is what do we need to do in order to scale, right? So what does it mean to scale? Very often we have successes, but so it's like having success um, with a particular group of patients in one district, but you can't scale it up and make it national. 
You can't, be, because the challenges of doing that, you need different kinds of talent to scale in innovation. Here's where you need the Rotman School. Um, you really need people who understand how you take a small success and scale it up. That's why we put together this team. And so let me tell you about the second project we were working on. And the second project is probably you've read about, because every, but everybody laughs when we talk about it. It's the toilet project. Have people read about it? Yeah, okay, Roger's read about it. So the toilet project, if you actually think what the biggest public health problem is globally today, it's the lack of sanitation. It is a lack of a capacity to have sanitary waste disposal because when you don't have a toilet, you use public space and you contaminate water supplies and you get disease. So in India, which is considered an emerging economy, we have half a billion people who have no access to toilets, if you just think about that, right? And what that means for public health. So here's so the Gates Foundation, who gets the fact that we need innovation in the social sector, not only in the private sector, puts out a global call to engineers, only to engineers, and here's the challenge to engineers, invent a toilet that's off the grid. In other words, uses no electricity and no water. Because that's, if you're trying to design a toilet that's gonna be that the, is gonna be accessible to the poorest of the poor, you can't assume a steady supply of electricity and you can't assume you're not gonna waste water that way because that's a scarce resource. Now that's a back-breaking problem in engineering. And Yuling Chen in our faculty of engineering was in the 100 that got through the first stage and actually is in the final three in the world that is working on this off the grid toilet. And I actually think, and she's explained it to me, she's explained the engineering to me 20 times, and to be honest, I don't understand it, okay? I really don't. But she seems to have cracked the problem. It's a complicated self-composting system where the toilet actually produces usable products that can be used um, to enhance crop yields when you're done with the whole thing. So that's, so the engineers lead the thing, but why do we need you, Rotman? Why should Rotman be part of this story? Well, it's gotta be affordable. What's the value of an off the grid toilet if the price point is so far out of reach of poor people that they will not buy it? Because poor people make decisions all the time about how they're gonna use the very scarce resources that they have. So the Rotman people came in, and did two kinds of research, which was absolutely crucial, and that's when the team really got cracking. The kinds of research they did were, how can we bring the base price down, and it's tough, but we all, but the Robin School also worked to understand what kind of choices poor people would make around this, and how, what would encourage adoption? How did the toilet have to be represented, right? So that people who are not familiar with this kind of thing, never seen it, don't really understand it, just like I was when I first heard about Blackberry, I didn't know what it was. What kind, uh, how did this have to be framed so that poor people would be encouraged to adopt it? So that should have been enough. So what do we need the social scientists for? Well. They finished these four and they thought they were done. And I said, no, you're not done. Where are you gonna put the toilet? If you can actually get it off the grid and you can actually get the price point down and we're in the final stages now with the Gates Foundation. You, and you can actually frame it in language which will make it a choice for poor people. There's one toilet to a village, that's all for sure because the price point won't come down that far. Where are you gonna put it? What do you think? Where? In the church. Well, first of all, a lot of villagers don't have churches. <laughs> they have mosques, they have temples, they don't have churches, but you're saying in the central religious institution, right? In that village? What's wrong with that? 
It's a good idea, but it doesn't work. I'm telling you right now, it doesn't work. And so here's what we've had happen in the past, by the way, in social innovation. We solve the technology problem, we solve the financing problem, and we think that's great, we're done. And then we don't understand why it's not adopted, right? Because we put it in the religious institution in the village. Why wouldn't that work? Think about it. Does your church want a toilet? Why wouldn't it work, Matthew? Uh, forces people to change their habits. Forces people to change their habits. That's a big strike against it right away. Secondly, these are usually sacred spaces, right, in each village. And that would not be a hospitable environment for most religious authorities for a toilet, frankly, even if you could persuade them how important it is. Uh, from a public health point of view. But you're getting, but I actually think you had a surrogate idea there. Where else would you put it? Yeah. Okay, that's the next answer everybody gave. Put it in a public space in the public square where the whole village goes. Now, to get really practical here, what's wrong with that? Doesn't work. Why do you think it wouldn't work? One toilet right in the public square in the village. They don't want to go in front of the whole village, exactly. It became the subject of village gossip, who was going when, how, how many times, when, what time of day, and nobody wanted that, right? It invaded their sense of privacy and dignity. So it's a reasonable solution it just doesn't work, right? Where else were we gonna do? So we could have come, let me come back to the point about social innovation. You could, have, you could, these brilliant engineers who cracked this problem for us. These Roman folks who came and tried to talk about a manufacturing process and how we could do this and how we can get the price down. We're not there yet, by the way, on price. And then we go put it in the village square, and nobody uses it. The history of social innovation is littered with this. Nobody uses it. That's why we need, all right, what's next? We, you make it mobile. OK, that's interesting. You make it mobile, what do you do? You put it in the community. Uh, well, you know, we haven't actually thought about that one because we're still grappling with it. But let me tell you the third suggestion that came. After it didn't work in the public square, the obvious thing was, well, put it on the outskirts of the village where you have privacy, right? What's wrong with that? Half the people in this room should know what's wrong with that. It's not safe for the women, exactly. No women would use it because if you're on the outskirts of the village, you're much more likely to be assaulted. Rose, where did they want to put it? So that's the right question, in fact. We went and did focus groups in the field with very poor villagers in Bangladesh. And Yuling spent, with our team of students, spent six months in these communities trying to figure out where. And it actually ended up not on the periphery, not in the center, but behind one of the small houses where people had some privacy so they couldn't see, but it was, people felt it would be safe enough. Now, we would never know that if we didn't ask. You know, that's where the outhouses used to be. That's where outhouses, of course. They were behind the house. That's right. So everybody does the same thing. That's right. So we're also saying that's where outhouses used to be in North America before we had toilets, right? So very similar kind of dynamics, but the crucial question is to treat the poor as consumers. Where do you want it? And not to make assumptions, which we've done for the last 50 years, and that's why development assistance is largely failure, not to make assumptions about where we think it should go, but actually, now, that works in a rural village. 80% of the world's poor now live in slums in cities. They've left villages and they live in slums. So we're going to do a second round now. 
uh, because the kind of innovation that we're, uh, that we're thinking about will be for the poorest urban dwellers. So how do we think about that problem? Now, we don't have the answer, but we know the question now, at least. Where do you think it should go, right? And that's the critical question of social innovation. So let me conclude because I think it's, I want to open this up for questions which is three or four general points when we think about this. The way social innovation will scale is when we ask people what they want and what they need and what they'll use. That's the first point. And that's actually fundamentally an agenda of dignity, right? It's rooted. Uh, secondly, if we don't partner with the private sector in really intelligent ways and break down these boundaries that we have with respect to the private sector, we are never going to leverage, one, the resources, and two, the smarts that are in the private sector so that we think about innovation in the broader social sector the way some of the very best people think about it in the private sector. These are all divisions, really, between the private sector and the public sector. And as long as the bottom line is always social value or social benefit, which sometimes it isn't, but as long as it is, we have to be open to entirely different kinds of partnerships with the private sector. I was in Ottawa all day today. Some of you may know that our Department of Foreign Affairs merged with our development agency, CETA. And it's, it's a merger that I actually strongly support for reasons that I just made clear, right? And one of the things we're talking about is a development finance institute, right? Where it's no longer simply giving people development assistance, but it's Mahmoud Yunus's question. How do we finance projects that you want, that you need, that you're going to use? Because if you want them, you need them, you're going to use them, you're going to maintain them. Which people don't when they don't want them or don't need them or don't think they'll use them. So we need to think very differently about partnerships with the private sector going forward. Thirdly, we need to bring in our voluntary institutions, the whole voluntary sector, that traditionally has worked on social problems, but has worked um, sometimes, unfortunately, in isolation from government and from the private sector. And that's also a dialogue that we have to have. Otherwise, we just, in reinforcing these silos, and we're missing the opportunity. You know, we have a group of students, and we're, here we're, treading on Rotman's territory, but a group of our students graduated from the Monk School two years ago formed something, because these are entrepreneurial kids that want to do good. And that's to me the most encouraging thing, that we're now finally getting in this country. Entrepreneurs, kids will take a risk, um, but they want to do it for the public good. So they formed something called the Social Innovation Research Group, and off they went to Taiwan. Um, and within a year, the government of Taiwan asked this group of 24-year-olds to provide the policy framework for social innovation. What kind of credits, right? What kind of insurance schemes? How can government be a partner? We haven't got that in Canada yet. And these kids are going on to Singapore when, they're, when they've done their job in Taiwan. So we need this to be a project that all sectors of society face. And my last comment, we have to change our attitude toward failure. I don't know any entrepreneurial person who hasn't failed repeatedly over and over again. The only interesting question about failure is, is it a stupid failure or a smart failure? And what's the difference between a stupid and a smart failure? A stupid failure is one, that happens when the reasons for not doing what you did are already out there, when the research is there, and you should know better, right? Because the work has already been done. The smart failures are when there's a chance this might work, and you're using the best knowledge. And you know what? It doesn't work. 
because most ideas don't work. But if we don't then create an environment for young people where we say, okay, that's fine, what'd you learn from this, right? Now what are you gonna do with that? And where young people pick themselves up off the floor and try it again in a different way. That's what Silicon Valley is, by the way. It's a culture that rewards smart failure. So when I go see a president of a university or CEO of a hospital, you know what question I ask them? Tell me about your most interesting failure this year. And the ones that really discouraged me are the ones who said, oh, we don't have any. You know what I say then? You didn't try anything then. Thank you very much, Jim. Happy to Hey, thank you so much, Janice. Uh, thank you for connecting the full circle of uh, technological innovation, economic innovation, and the social capital innovation that's embedded within that. So we have some time for some questions from the audience. We don't have a roaming microphone, so we might have to yell it out a little bit here. Uh, and uh, this is your opportunity to ask the expert. You know what I'll do? I'll repeat the question if I can hear it. And if I can't, Joe will hear it and help me out. Tony, you going to start us off? Yeah. Um, part of what you're talking about is social innovation. We have a form of microfinancing here, I guess the term we all use is crowdfunding. And there really is, you're probably familiar with it, it's called CSI, Center for Social Innovation, and there's quite a few of them around. And that is sort of a North American version to me of microfinance. So let me just repeat the question very quickly while people can hear it. Well, we do have social innovation. We have the Center for Social Innovation, which is on backers. Uh, we have something called crowdfunding, so I'm going to come back, but which you think is the equivalent of microfinance. And what the question is? The question is, um, what do you think in regards, you know, I can't see it's the same as microfinance because we're a bunch of richer Okay, so this is a question about social innovation in, in North America. So the, the, the numbers are a totally different order, obviously, in a society like ours. Crowdfunding is actually not microfinance. Crowdfunding is a very different thing, crowdsourcing. So people have ideas, right? And this is part of what the web enables. And there are several places now where you put your idea up on a website, and people who think it's imaginative, innovative, um, fund it. Very small amounts of funding, but large numbers of very small funders give people enough seed capital often to start something. So that's very much you know, in the private sector. Um, but instead of having to look for one investor who lead the process, like everything else with the web, it's distributing the capacity to get involved. So we have large numbers of small investors who get involved in the project. And we've had success, actually, with that. But what defines a social investor as opposed to a crowdfunder? A social investor, the bottom line is, yes, this has to be economically sustainable, but it has to produce social benefit in addition. So we actually have examples in our own society where microfinance is making a difference. Anybody ever buy Ace Breads? Okay, Ace Breads is microfinance. It was started by Martin Connell. It was microloans to individuals who didn't have jobs, whom he, and they started bakeries, very small bakeries. The best of those bakeries then become Ace became Ace Bakery, and Ace Bakery today is actually owned 
by multiples of individuals who are small bakers who have now been able to franchise this, many of these people coming from the poor sector of Toronto society. So a very similar model works here. Paul Martin has been working for the last three years virtually full time to start microfinance models in Aboriginal communities in this society. But you're also right, you're also right that once these, it's not enough to have a cow and a calf, right? You actually have to grow that business. So how do we then, and if access, if you think about it even in our own society, if you're a homeless person, or you're uneducated, or you're unemployed, you have no capacity to borrow money to start it. So how, once you get that early success, where are the pools of finance to enable people to take what is small success and grow it? It's a very, very similar challenge. And here the benefit is not the bread, it's the employment opportunities we create for young people who have no jobs. You actually look at the world we live in now, where in Greece, 54% of young people between 18 and 25 are unemployed. 54%. I mean, in Italy, 43 or 44%. It's, it's one of the biggest social challenges we have going forward of how we enable people to innovate um, and to create employment which is the bedrock of any stable society, employment for young people, uh, and governments can't do this. It's got to come in partnership um, with the social sector. So it's, it's, we're, we're only at the beginning of this research, frankly. But you're right that we need those $5,000 loans and the $10,000 loans. Those are risky. Yes? This is great. It's just a gentleman over there. And Sorry, Joe. Okay, if you're watching that. No, no, no. This is also to do with microfinance. It has to do with the interest rate. Are you aware of a charity called Kiva? Right, Kiva. Now, in Kiva, the lender, you and I, doesn't have a problem. I'm wondering if the interest rate is as high or something like that. Yeah, so the, Grameen, the question is, there's charity, it's not a charity. I mean, that's the whole point. It's not a charity. Kiva is a very, very well-known um, social innovator. It's web-based, right? And I actually got a little, into a little trouble a couple of years ago because what it does is put up the projects that people would like to start. These are all poor people, right? So the projects go up on the website and you pick the project that you want to fund. Um, and it's an investment model. You get your money back, but you get your money back without interest. The Grameen Bank is fundamentally just recovering its costs. So that 34% is administration costs. Because Kiva has web-based technology, its costs are much, much lower. And even, that's what's going to happen. You know, to give you an example of one other one, which is really stunning, cheap cell phones. So, do you know what cheap cell phones do in poor societies? Two things. One of which will interest Roger and Rose, and one of which will interest anybody who's a farmer in this room, okay? Kenya is the world leader in making, in manufacturing, really cheap cell phones. So they borrow the technology, but they push the price way down. Now, why does that matter? Because if you have diabetes, you prick your finger. You smear it on the screen of the smartphone. The data goes to the regional health center. They analyze your blood sugar and they send a message back on the cell phone because these are illiterate people. Smiley face or sad face. People don't have to read. And so they're managing diabetes at a fraction of the cost that we're managing diabetes in developed societies. Where else are farmers getting? Where else are kidneys getting on their smartphones? They're getting crop prices. So instead of having, as they did five years ago, middlemen that were charging extortionate rates for crops, 
They now know they get these prices every day, and if there's one literate person in the village, they share the information. They know when the price of cocoa is high, medium, or low, and they can make an informed decision about when to sell, and frankly, not be ripped off by the middleman. Now, I want, one of the interesting things we're gonna start in this country, we're gonna start figuring out what we can learn from social innovation in the South. What can we learn from it here? Why should it cost $10 a year to manage a diabetic in Kenya, and what's the approximate cost here for diagnostic testing and management? More, Roger's gonna tell me, right? Is it more? Lots more. So what we know is there are discrepancies of about a hundredfold, and no difference in the results that we're getting, in the reliability of the results. So the next disruptive revolution that's coming is when we take what we've done, the innovations that we've done for the poor, and we start bringing them back home because we have fundamentally an unsustainable growth, growth rate of health expenditures in this country. Yeah. Fair trade movement is different from microeconomies. Fair trade movement is very different ish. The fair trade movement is what you you saw explode in Bangladesh in the factories, right? So the fair trade movement is about certifying that the way products are made where labor, and these products are competitive globally because labor costs are very low, right? So the fair trade movement certifies, it puts a little sticker on the labor conditions in the factory were fair. Uh, the factories are not fire hazards. Uh, there is reasonable health benefits for people who work in these factories. So it's a certification process. And what it does, consumers in the rich world some people will only buy fair trade coffee. So it's all about the process by which the product is grown or manufactured in terms of its fairness to the people who are making it. Very different, very different. Total, I mean, separate. Not One is not necessarily linked to the other. It's like carpets from Afghanistan, right? If you buy carpets, there is a, an association that certifies that no children under five made these carpets. Because people don't want to buy carpets made by, and I've seen this, made by children who sit for 18 hours a day in a room, which they do. So it has a stamp on it. And so these are all certification measures. Now they're effective, obviously, to some degree, but to me, it is, not the same as encouraging poor people to start enterprises of their own which create employment. And again, if you think about it, who best understands what another poor person needs? Somebody who's, deep, who's living in that community, right? And can assess what will work and what the demand is. It's like food aid. We used to send, send food aid after a crisis. We don't do it anymore. You know what we send? Because food aid flooded the market and pushed out of business all the local producers of food. Now we, we distribute cash. That's what you heard after the typhoon in the Philippines. Please send cash. Don't send products. Because why is that? Because you're trying to restart the local producers as quickly as you can, and you're, you're trying to flood the markets with credit. And when people have money, they buy. So how good is the broader humanitarian movement um, uh, doing what I just talked about? It depends. Right? And it's actually think, something I think that is informed givers. You want to understand which organizations are simply giving aid and which organizations are using their dollars strategically in the way that I just described. There are big differences among those who raise funds. 
big differences. So I'm just going to go to somebody who hasn't asked a question yet. Have I missed anybody, Joe? OK. My question is, can it start at home? Can it start at home? Sure. Okay, so I, that, I realize that there are problems psychologically as drugs or alcohol, but we need to. But let me. Sure that, that sort of person is healthy as well. So the, the comment was we need to start at home. food and a warm place to actually help these people find jobs so they're not homeless. And that's the difference in the two models. One is a charity model, the other is an enabling model. And what we know from research is as long as you continue with a charity model, you remove the incentive to enable. So, that's why we've stopped giving development assistance in that way. Because it doesn't address the underlying problem. It's very hard for you to actually see the individuals who need help. I understand that. But what we need is a strategy for homeless people, right? Where we, where we enable those who can, who are not suffering, from deeper difficulties to actually find productive employment where they can then afford a home. That's the objective. And that's going to come from the social innovators, but the private sector has to be a part and government has to be a part. We have to think about this very differently. Yes? Sometimes you don't get changes because people don't come up with ideas which are clever enough to produce them. In the case of the example where it's being convenient, so I oh, just want to make sure people hear you. So I want to just repeat your comment. Could you repeat it? Because it's hard for you. Sometimes you get changes to occur in some environments that aren't resistant to change. They just need good ideas to change what happens. Can you give the example of the treatment of diabetes and the treatment of the civilian medical conditions in the medical society? Change doesn't happen because people don't have good ideas often. So it's a really, really good question, okay? Um, sometimes the good ideas are there, but there are institutional blockages to change, right? Yes, absolutely there are. And to give you an example, in our own society, we have you know, a very, very complex healthcare system with a lot of vested interests. So it's very hard to change um, because people are familiar with the system, benefit from the system, know how the system works, and don't want to disrupt it. Um, that's when you need, that's when you really need disruptors. You really, I think we undervalue disruptors in our society. The second problem is when do we get change despite these obstacles? When we don't have any more resources to throw at the problem. As long as we're comfortable and we have enough resources to throw at the problem, we're not going to get the change. Well, we're actually moving into that kind of period now because we're in for five more years of restricted social spending. And in some sectors, we're going to hit a wall. And innovation is often driven by urgency. And that's when you get a capacity to disrupt an ossified system, right? The third obstacle, and I, you know, I, wow. Uh, if you just think what we've spent our time on in this country in the last month, we've spent our time on three senators and a half a million dollar problem. It's nuts. 
All right? I, I, I say here, the lunatics have taken over the asylum. You know, and we spent more on the audits than the money that was actually missed back. So we're designing our system and we're designing our society to catch cheaters. That's not an innovative society. I would rather have some cheaters, fine, but free up the rest of us from these onerous reporting systems and grant writing where somebody comes every three months to make sure that you the postage stamp you claimed as an expense was real, and did you make a duplicate receipt for the postage stamp? You know, we have government grants, and we spend 60% of it on staff to file reports on how we're spending the money. That leeches creativity out of a society. So we have to, if we don't assume that most people don't cheat, and it increased our tolerance for somebody who did what one of those senators did and not gasp, but say we have bigger, more important problems. Let's get on with life. Now, Rob Ford, we're not going to talk about it at all. <laughs> so I think, um, as, as Jen has said, she was up at 5 a.m. advising Ottawa on just those issues. So please join me on behalf of the, the college and everyone in thanking Janice Stein. Mm -hmm. Janice, we have a small token of appreciation uh, for your fantastic lecture and thank you so much for joining us for the Memorial Saul Goldstein Lecture. So I'd like to invite everyone, we have some refreshments at the back, some drinks, so please continue the conversation of all the exciting stuff that Janice has uh, highlighted here, and we invite you to socialize. So thank you everyone for joining us.